Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Howdy, folks. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. It's Shay here. Today, we are going to be talking about what cattle producers need to consider when they are designing cattle facilities, whether they're adding on or they need to completely demo what they have and start fresh. So we are going to be visiting with Jake Schubert. And Jake is originally from the Sandhills of Nebraska, kind of the Valentine area, but he currently lives in Russia right now. And so we're going to talk a little bit about his story, how he got involved with helping cattle producers design facilities and really help make their vision come to life and make their lives less stressful on those cattle working days, as well as his story about um, how he got to Russia and uh, kind of some differences he sees in facilities in different parts of the country when he's helping different cattle producers. So before we dive into the episode, I do want to remind you that I do have a weekly newsletter that shares different resources, whether that's podcast episodes, um, the summaries, as well as industry news, and a few other added tidbits that I think would help you guys as cattle producers, and that's all free. So be sure to go to my website and uh, you can sign up there. But with that, let's visit with Jake. Hey folks, I want to introduce you to a breakthrough in cattle deworming from Zoetis. This is the only prescription cattle dewormer with two active ingredients in one dose. Meet Valcor, Doramectin, and Levamisole injection. Now you can achieve effective parasite control in one product instead of two. It's never been easier to be tough on tough worms. Get tough today at Valcor.com. Do not treat cattle with Valcor within 15 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows. Not for use in beef calves less than 2 months of age, dairy calves, and veal calves. See full pricing information at valcortuff.com slash pi, and that link will be in the show notes. Well, Jake, it is great to have you on the show today. I guess um, I've been following you on LinkedIn for a little while and very intrigued by what you're doing, so I've enjoyed our chats back and forth through WhatsApp and uh, learning a little bit about how you're serving cattle producers with cattle handling facilities. So thanks for joining the show. I'm excited to have you on today. You bet. Good to be here. So to start off, I'd really like to hear a little bit more about your story and how you got started in the cattle handling facility space. What does that look like for you? Because you're in Russia right now, correct? Yep, in St. Petersburg. It is definitely not cow country right here in the middle of a big city. Um, So I kind of grew up in the sand hills. My dad was a ranch hand until I was, I don't know, third or fourth grade. And then we moved to town and uh, he started a, a shop called Plus One Manufacturing that's still still going there. And uh, so I really kind of grew up in it since, I don't know, I was 10 or 11 years old. We started building corrals all over the sand hills and then eventually all over the U.S. We traveled from Kentucky and Indiana in the east all the way to Oregon or Montana in the west, um, building stuff for bison corrals and feedlots and, and cattle corrals and sale barns and all kinds of stuff. So I really I kind of grew up building this kind of stuff. And then... About, oh, it's been almost 15 years ago in like 2008 or so, I started using the 3D modeling to help clients visualize what they're going to get before they start building. Because it was always a problem um, nailing down a design with clients because, you know, most people are not designers. Um, most people aren't really good at making blueprints and and uh, figuring out exactly what they need before they start building. And it's especially true with something like a corral where most people will only build one or two sets of corrals in their whole year or in their whole life. So I was working on a project with the uh, Valentine sale barn to replace uh, the loading docks that they had. And we, you know, having a hard time communicating exactly what, what we were going to be building for them and, you know, exactly what it would, do better than their old loading docks. So that's when I started using SketchUp to, to make 3D models and show the clients, you know, what a new set of corrals will look like. 
And then after I, I moved overseas, I kind of needed a way to make some money without having to just go illegally work changing oil or something. So I decided to double down on the design stuff and, and start a company and start marketing it to uh, you know, basically just sell a design service just for corrals and uh, uh, cabin barns and, and uh, you know, beef, beef cattle infrastructure, basically. So and why, been, why did you ahead. move overseas? Well, that's a long story too. I, in the, I think it was 2011, I traveled to Kazakhstan for the first time and uh, I was there to help some, to help some people that were, that were selling cows. And anyway, long story short, I ended up meeting my wife in Kazakhstan and she's from St. Petersburg, but I met her in Kazakhstan and uh this end of 2017, I moved over here. We got married and started having kids. So, Okay. So why are you passionate about cattle handling facilities specifically? Well, I think it's, it's more about helping the people than it is cattle handling uh, for me. Because when I was building stuff, I saw people had a lot of trouble, you know, visualizing what they're going to build um, before they start having to start spending tens of thousands of dollars to start building stuff and oftentimes not turn out exactly like they wanted. So to me, it was really more about helping people design and build something that, that they need, but they don't have any real experience in building. Um, and I, I do enjoy working with cows. I enjoy handling cows. Um, I think it's a you know, a good thing to have a low stress cattle handling, both for the animal welfare, but also just from the business sense. It's if you can avoid hurting an animal, it's going to make you more money. So, so it, it makes sense that way too. Yeah. And that's something that I think you've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners. It all does go down to helping the people. That's where a lot of that reward comes in. Yeah, it really is. Um, a lot of my clients are younger guys in their thirties or so that are starting ranch and they need to, you know, rebuild the old homestead that they bought or inherited that was built in the fifties. Mm -hmm. And they want to build something that they don't have to, that they're not going to regret in the future. And they're not going to wish they'd done a lot of changes to. So a lot of the times the designs are more, you know, more of a long reaching plan of how they would like everything to be. And I'm sure they'll get changed in the future, but at least it gives them a good place to start to build a set of corrals that will grow into whatever they end up doing in the future. So how, so when you are working with clients, cause I like that point that you said, like it's a long ranging plan. And I think about that myself. Cause like, I remember I was in late junior high, early high school, when we redid our facilities. And at the time it was like, wow, we're never going to fill these corrals on cattle sure. day. And now our cow herd size has grown and it's like, Hmm, we could sure use a few extra pens over here. So how do you work with your clients to help get that long picture plan? And at least, you know, is it looking at building just like a starter set of corrals that can, or design that can easily be added on to, or is it looking at the big picture right away? Like what, how do you go navigate that? It, it really depends on the, the person um, and the project, because if, you know, if a person, you know, a lot of times, a, say a feedlot or an established ranch, they really know what they need for a set of corrals. They, they're just having a hard time getting it drawn up so they can get it built. Those are pretty straightforward projects. Um, but for the, the person that's buying a new homestead and, and, designing everything for the future a lot of times you just have to talk about how many cows they'd like to have in five or ten years um is this something that they're going to have 50 cows or are they going to have 500 cows and then from there you can kind of design a facility that even if they can't build it all right now they can they can expand into it uh a good example would be designing the set of corrals that you can actually build the building over the chute and alleyway later. So trying to get the chute and alleyway more toward the edge in a place that you can actually build a building around it. Um, and one of the things you can do is like 
you know, design in the building that you want and then build the corrals around it and leave yourself a three or four or five foot gap in between where the wall is going to be in the future and your existing corrals. And then the worst case scenario, you might have to cut a couple of fences and replace them with gates when you go to put the building in, but you're not going to have to redesign the whole thing. It's all kind of built in. And another really good thing you can do for that is build pens that can be added on to, um, you know, we'll have either sorting pens or staging pens, you know, before the shoot, before the cows are worked, you can build those so that you can always add on two or four of them in the future and have it still, still be working right. So when you look at like, older facilities that are those those older homesteads and then you get like the next generation on that's like we got to change this what are like the biggest mistakes or flaws in those older facilities that you help producers change in new ones well, honestly a lot of older facilities older corrals the best thing is that you're you're gonna usually demolish the whole older the corral part that you're actually working cows there's usually not a good way to, to just, you know, rectify that situation. A lot of times, a lot of times you do have to use the old holding pens and stuff, but the corrals itself, the heart of the corral where you've got to shoot in an alley and some sort of forcing pen, almost always those are going to get removed. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, it, it, like that's, that's removed, is it, it because if, if, they're it, is it because they're too small or they just don't account for animal behavior and flow or is was there anything like reason. that um a lot of times they're old so they're just in bad condition um you know if somebody's starting out and they've got a workable set of corrals you don't want to spend fifty thousand dollars building a better set of corrals when you've got something that works but if, a lot of times on an old homestead the facilities are just so bad that it's barely, you know, it's, it's something you have to bail and wire everything up before you work cows every time. Those type of deals, if, you, if you're going to spend the money to build a new set of corrals, you're better off just, just doing it and getting it over with. Um, but yeah, you know, depends on the place, but just bad condition fence is not worth repairing, even if it did work good. A lot of times it's as bad uh, cattle handling and it's not a lot of times it's not so much you can't get the cows into the alleyway and into the chute it's just that it's hard to do it it takes a lot of running back and forth and climbing over fences and uh, it's just too much work so, yeah so do you have like a preferred material whether well, it's because I think of like the old facilities and so many of them are wood. And mm -hmm. then like, I know like our, like my family's, we like pipe if possible. So like, do you have like a preferred material that you recommend for producers to look at? Most of the facilities get built with pipe, you know, used oil flow pipe is probably the most, most common by far material to build new corrals out of. Um, so yeah, stuff like two and seven eighths oil flow pipe for the main posts and four and a half inch drill stem for the the gates is kind of what I what I recommend and what I design around. Some people do end up using the you know some alternatives like guardrails is a pretty common alternative if a person can get them at a significantly lower price. But yeah, even with the increases in prices in the last five years, the oilful pipe is still the best deal to build the fence with. Okay. So you talked about, you know, right away when you're working with clients, you ask, you know, the goal, like, are you going to have 50 cows? Or are you going to have 500 cows? What else do they need to be considering when they're thinking about a new facilities? Sure. One of the things is uh, how you're going to sort the cows. And most modern facilities, you want to have some kind of way to do your sorting after they release from the chute. Um, as much as possible, you're always going to have to sort out cows and calves before you run them through the chute. But almost all other sorting 
can get done as the cows are released from the chute. And it's just easier that way because you've got the cow caught, you've got all of her information, you want to put her in a new group right then anyway. So it's just easier to do it by swinging a gate in front of the chute than it is by trying to catch her in an alleyway, read her tag, figure out what you wanted to do with her, and and doing it that way. So that's one thing is to, to think about how much sorting you want to do and might potentially want to do in the future and how you want to do that sorting. Is it going to be horseback in the pen? Is it going to be in the alleyway on foot? Or do you want to do it all in front of the chute as, they, as they're released? That's one, one good thing to think about. Um, another really good thing to think about is to try to position your loading, your loading docks at the beginning of your design so that you can have a great place to back your horse trailer or cattle pot up to instead of making it kind of an afterthought. So if we're, if we're going to build something that has a, a loading dock on it, which is most, um, this is one of the first things I try to place is where the loading dock is going to be and where any new building and, and the cattle and the chute are going to be. And then you kind of, the rest of it just kind of grows from there. But a lot of, a lot of designs and, and even new stuff I've seen, a lot of, a lot of people seem to just kind of put the loading dock in as an afterthought, but really it's one of the main things you use a curls for. <clears throat> yeah, it is. It is important. I know uh, whenever we have to haul something out of my grandpa's facilities, getting a trailer backed in is a little bit of a challenge because you got to kind of sure. come in at an angle and it's, it's nice to have a place when you can do it and you're not, um, I guess crammed for how big of a trailer you can get in or how hard it yeah. is to back up and turn around and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We, you got to think a lot of these old homesteads predate modern cattle pots by 50 years. Mm -hmm. Never thinking of never, probably never imagined trailers that big to come get cows. <laughs> probably not. So, you know, you've been, involved with this industry since you were a kid and what would you say are some of the biggest changes you've seen as you've become more experienced in the industry as well as globally what have you seen as far as differences in design I think the biggest difference from when I was a kid I think people are a lot more willing to spend a lot more money now in order to create a great facility that only requires two or three people to operate because the help is just harder to find now than it was 30 years ago. And people are willing to spend a year's wage for, a, you know, what a hired man's year's wage um, to build a great set of corrals if they can do it with less people. I think that's probably the biggest difference. And you, I think you see that even more in feedlots than on ranches. Um, because feedlots are using it every week or every day. So being able to save a, save some manpower or just be able to work cows through faster, it's you know definitely worth it to spend $100,000 for better corrals. The safety side of that too is important, <clears throat> I think, as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I didn't even, didn't even mention that. You know, the, the people that's, you know, especially in feedlots, if you can reduce bruising on the animals, that is an immediate payoff, um, you know, just with less, less bruised carcasses. So you can, if you take an old set of krells and replace it with something that works good, it can pay for itself in a few months in some cases um, with reduced bruising if you're having a bad problem. Yeah. So what about globally when you're helping people like outside of the Midwest? Like what right. do you, what's different? What differences are you seeing? Well, you know, I I haven't ever designed a project in Australia, but I did visit there, you know, about 10 years ago buying some cows. And it was interesting that a lot of the facilities that that I saw and a lot of the manufacturers that I look at there, a lot of it is uh, like more prefabricated than it is in the US. It's panels that people buy and bolt together. And I think you're seeing that now with like AeroQuips 
systems that they're selling and silencer has some systems like that that you get a whole set of curls as panels and they're they're not really portable panels you put them together and bolt them down and you get a full set of corrals that's kind of an interesting difference from the way we always did it in nebraska with you know posts and dig in the ground and i'm not sure why it is but i suspect it's because of high high labor costs in the rural areas even they are even more than in the U.S. Um, working in Asia and and Eastern Europe is just a totally different ball game because there is no tradition of of working cows. If you know, of, there's no real tradition of working beef cows the way we do in the Midwest. Um, you know, pretty much zero. Most of the cattle here traditionally have either been, you know, they've been herded kind of an old old fashioned way or the dairy cows. So over the last 15 years of the, as they've imported western genetics and trying to build western ranches they've had to kind of build the build the knowledge base and build the infrastructure from scratch um, with varying degrees of success. <laughs> well, so thank- you see some really bad corrals here. <laughs> even brand new stuff you just kind of sometimes scratch your head and wonder what they were thinking because they why do you <clears throat> what about them makes you scratch your head just a completely not designing with stuff like a bud box or a tub but I've seen facilities that had extremely long alleyways where they would just run all the cows and they'd have 30 or 40 cows in an alleyway to give vaccinations or shots or stuff. Um, and it didn't really work very good, but they it's kind of the way they've done it in the past and it kind of works, even though it's dangerous. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. And a lot of it is just not having really any idea of how the cattle are going to work. So they just, uh, you know, build a facility and get some guys in there and start beating on the cows and get them to go into the chute. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, if we build a good facility here, it works as good as it does in the States. Once you show somebody how it works and, and get them some proper, you know, an alleyway that's the right length and the right width, you can make cows work just as good here as you can anywhere. So if there was like one thing or like sometimes I phrase this, if you had your own magic wand, it can change anything about how people are using or designing cattle facilities. What would you change? Oh, about designing them? It'd be the people who just plan it and spend a lot of time planning it before starting to build stuff. I think that's the one thing I would change for how people are building it, how people are using it, have more patience, you know. Bring five cows at a time, not 15. (laughs) The fastest way to work cattle is slow. (laughs) Right. Hey, folks, I want to introduce you to a breakthrough in cattle deworming from Zoetis. This is the only prescription cattle dewormer with two active ingredients in one dose. Meet Valcor, Doramectin, and Levamisole injection. Now you can achieve effective parasite control in one product instead of two. It's never been easier to be tough on tough worms. Get tough today at Valcor.com. Do not treat cattle with Valcor within 15 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows. Not for use in beef calves less than two months of age, dairy calves, and veal calves. See full pricing information at valcortuff.com slash PI. And that link will be in the show notes. Great. Well, so are there any other like mistakes you see or tips you want to share with cattle producers? I know we talked about the loading facility before. You just talked about the importance of planning and kind of keeping that having that visionary idea of what you want to be someday, but is there anything else that we haven't touched on that's really important for producers to think about? Sure. You know, one of the things that, that you need to think about is the environment and how, you know, how, how you're going to get mud in the krills, how the water is going to run out. Um, so you, you need to think about that as well as 
how the cattle are going to move through and how the people are going to move through. And I think it's something that a lot of people maybe don't don't think about when they think when they're designing corrals or don't think about enough. So one of the ways you can make that work better is to try to get your shoot at one of the highest points in the corrals so that, you know, you're going to put a building over there that should be at the high point, not a low point. Um, so that's, that's one thing I think that uh, is good advice if people are building a facility on any kind of ground that has some, some altitude change to it. And if you're on flat ground, there's nothing wrong with moving some dirt and building your building up a foot or two. It's, is that something you see people changing a lot when they are on those older operations and kind of starting from scratch? Are they shifting where the chute in their facilities is compared to where it used to be? You know, in general, not too much. Um, it's more of a consideration when we've got a, a new a new place that we're building of trying to find a place that's not going to become a mud hole any more than it is. But on, on old facilities, a lot of times you're really locked into where you can put stuff because you got, already have roads and buildings there. So you've already got a place you've got to put a loading chute and you've already got pins to tie into. So a lot of times it really just kind of, it builds around all those things. And if you, if you need to, you just have to do some dirt work to, to make sure that the water runs, runs out of the pans. Okay. It's, it's hard to drastically change the location if stuff is already built, built yeah. up around it. Yeah. So with that, you know, you made a previous comment before, like, are you going to be sorting horseback? Are you going to be more on foot? What are the differences in designs that you would make if people are using horses more as opposed to being on foot? I know the type of gates, that's important because I've opened a lot of chain gates on a horse and that's not as sure. fun. <laughs> but sure. what other considerations are you making when you're looking at footwork versus horseback? Sure. Well, one of the big things with with horseback is just to give more room because the flight zone is obviously bigger when you're on horseback. So building alleys that are more like 14 or even 16 foot wide is appropriate when you're working with horses. But if you're only on foot, you can't really work with an alley that big very well. So the alleys are more like 10, uh, 12 is mo most common, sometimes 10 if a person has really gentle cows. Um, that's probably the biggest difference. But also if if you're only working horseback, it works a lot better to have bigger square pins. And if you're only working on foot, it works better to have well, like 13, 14 foot wide pins that, mm -hmm. that you can, one person can go in there with the flag and move cows out. Okay. <clears throat> and yeah, you, you said the, the gate latches and that that's something that, that uh, a lot of times I don't even really design in because everybody kind of has their own yeah. opinion on the best gate latch. So you put the gate latch on for horses or, or just have chain latches if that's all you need. So what about from, you talked about, you know, if you can't do it all right away, like just considering like, okay, if you want a building over your shoot someday, just plan for that. What other considerations need to be in mind when we're thinking about putting a building over the top of our chute and that alley that runs into the chute and probably your tub too? Sure. <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, I guess one is, is one piece of advice, I guess, is to make it taller. Um, so there's always wasted space in a building that's being put over a, an alley in the bud box because it's all the bud box system is always kind of l-shaped so you've got a big space that you can put an office in or park vehicles in so design the building tall enough that you can get you know if you're only parking pickups in it only needs to be 10 or 12 foot tall doors but if you want to park in feed wagons it's going to need to be taller so that's one thing um making sure that the building has good access to drive up to and that's important for a lot of reasons one is to be able to use it for parking two is to just be able to drive right up to the chute with your pickup instead of having to park on the other side of a fence and and carry stuff up to the chute mm 
Um, you know, you can the vet can come out and back his pickup right up to the chute. That's a lot better than if you have to go carry stuff and set up a tent. Absolutely. Um, another thing is to when you're talking about the inside of a building and and the area around the chute and alleyway is to give yourself workspace beside that alley and chute. So you've got a chute that's what three, four foot wide, and then you need room for a person to stand there to work the chute, but you also need a table to put your tools and stuff on. And ideally you would have enough room that another guy can walk behind him without tripping over him. So ultimately you need from the center line of that chute out, you really need about 10 foot minimum before you get to the wall, if you want to use that side of the chute effectively. So try to get your chute away from the wall 10 foot, it's going to make life a lot. It's going to make it a lot more usable. And that also lets you have workspace beside the alleyway to get in and out of a cow, the cow's flight zone to move the cows forward. Because if you're in tight quarters, you're always going to be pushing them back as you walk back down the alley and just causing more stress than needs to be be there yeah. so that's that's something and the same applies for the front of the shoot um you know if you want the shoot indoors you want to have it far enough indoors that you can work even if there's a rain coming in you don't want to if you have the front of the shoot right at the door or a foot away from the door you're always going to be having to walk through the rain if it's raining mm -hmm. so getting it inside enough that you can uh, walk in front comfortably you know at least four or six foot back from the door is good all right jake well you have shared a lot of amazing insight and information so before we wrap up today do you have any final thoughts oh, that was great great talking with you and if anybody has any questions um just reach out to me by email at the jake at arcsconsulting.net um, or find me on facebook Yep. And I will be sure to include um, your website in the show notes as well so that sure. people can just easily go look there. And I think they can contact you off the website too, yep. correct? You can just Perfect. reach me directly from the website and I'm always happy to answer questions. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, Jake. You bet. Thank you. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.